Yeah, so I'm Josh Campbell, and so I do work for the USDA Agricultural Research Service over in Sydney. So I'm sorry I couldn't be there today due to the the weather and potential issues with traveling. But I'm going to talk to you today about energy development on pollinating insects. So this might be a little bit different presentation than you've had previously. And so when we talk about pollinators, I'm mostly talking about native bees. Uh, the top three photos are native bees that you may find in North Dakota, Montana, elsewhere, as opposed to the non-native honeybee. That's the photo at the bottom. And so I have a number of projects that I have worked on that are related to energy development and looking at the impacts on pollinators. Yeah, so why are we interested in pollinators? So about three quarters of all flowering plants that we know of are dependent on some sort of animal pollination, which is largely done by some type of insect, mostly bees. If you go to the grocery store, almost all of the fruits, vegetables, nuts that you see are dependent on pollinators uh, to set seed and or fruit. And in this, and in this part of the, the country, the Northern Great Plains, if you have a diverse pollinator community, you have a diverse plant community, and, and you have a healthy rangeland. So bees are considered the most important and prolific pollinators. And worldwide, there are about 20,000 species of what we would term native bees. There's about 4,000 in the U.S. And I just put this into comparison to the honeybee, in which in the United States we have one species of honeybee. It is non-native. It originated in Asia and was brought over about to the United States about 400 years ago. And so you can see in the, the top right picture, this is just a kind of a collage of different types of native bees. They can be very large, like bumblebee size, to very tiny. And when you look at native bees, as opposed to the honeybee, the majority of them nest in the ground. So most of them actually dig their own hole or entrance to their, their nest. And then the other thir roughly 30% of native bees, instead of nesting in the ground, they nest in dead rotten wood or the pifs of uh, stems and the majority of native bees are solitary as opposed to the honeybee which forms large colonies. Now although native bees and the honeybee are considered the most important pollinators there are a lot of other insects out there that also act as pollinators and I'm just going to highlight a few. This is kind of a hot topic in entomology these days is looking at non-bee pollinators simply because we don't know a lot about them. Uh, this is just uh, some random photos of some of the more common non-bee pollinators. So top left would be types of dipterans, types of flies, so like hoverflies, bee flies. Bottom left are types of wasp. Wasp can actually pollinate a lot of plants that we know. And then, of course, on the, the right side, you've got butterflies and moths. And then at the bottom right, lots of beetles can actually act as pollinators. Unfortunately, it's not all good news when you're looking at pollinators. What we're kind of seeing, and this is kind of global, is that pollinators are declining in abundance. They're, they're, a lot of their ranges are, start, are becoming highly reduced. And, and even when you look at just the northern Great Plains, we know very little about, especially about native pollinator communities. And I like to, to give an example of the bumblebee. That's the middle photo there. That's the rusty patch bumblebee, just to give you an idea about how some of the declines that we're seeing. And this is this is a an exaggerated case, but that particular bumblebee was extremely common about 20, 25 years ago. And now its range and numbers have been reduced by about 99%. Scary part of that is we actually have no idea why it has uh, shrunk in range and population. We know that there's a lot of stressors out there for not just native pollinators, but honeybees as well. And these can include things like habitat fragmentation, various agricultural practices like the spraying of pesticides, 
uh, exotic plants and other species that have invaded our landscape can, can play a, a negative role. So I'm going to talk about a few projects that I have worked on that dealt with pollinators and energy development. And mostly when I'm talking about energy development, I'm talking about the conversion of land for energy development. And so I'm going to show you three different projects that I've worked on. One involves the removal of non-native grasses. So it's a prairie restoration project. And then we planted native grasses and native forbs. And I'll show you the impacts it had on pollinators. And this is analogous to what happens along uh, after they put in pipelines. The second project I'll, I'll quickly talk about is looking at biofuel grasses that were grown in Mississippi. And then the third thing that's more of a recent project is looking at so the building of solar facilities in the Mojave Desert of California and its impact on pollinators. And so first project that I'll, I'll quickly go over, and I'm not going to give you a lot of details on this, but we'll just call this a prairie restoration project. This, this was done in, over in near Sydney, Montana. And so we had a rancher who was interested in getting rid of non-native crested wheatgrass and he had uh, pastures that were basically a monoculture of it and so we divided this pasture up into different plots and applied different types of herbicide treatments and mostly the herbicide treatments were either uh, two times or three times the label rate of glyphosate the reason we did not use the label rate of glyphosate is that it is well known that it will not be effective against crested wheatgrass. And if you're interested in the, the plants that we planted, I put them down at the bottom middle part of this screen. I'm not going to read them to you. And so here's just a, a quick photo of kind of how the plots were laid out and what the surrounding landscape looked like before they removed the cattle off these plots. And so my goal was to look at pollinators and how they are impacted by this prairie restoration. And so I monitored, for this project, I monitored pollinating insects in two, two manners. I did sweep net surveys in which I collected insects that were actively visiting flowering plants. And then I used something called an emergence trap. And that's your bottom right photo. And so it looks like a small little white tent. There, there is not a bottom to it. And so basically, if you remember from earlier that most of your native bees nest in the ground and so we put these tents over a section of ground and then whatever emerges from the ground flies upwards and gets collected in that collecting cup that you can kind of see on the top and so just a quick timeline the herbicide treatments were put in in 2020 and then I started monitoring pollinators shortly after the herbicide treatments were put in in 2020 and the following year in 2021. And I'm going to show, I'm going to show you a, a series of, of uh, bar graphs that kind of show you what we found. And so what you're looking at here is from our emergence traps. And so what, and so what you see is that in the herbicided plots, whether it's two times or three times, we had increased native bee nesting or ground nesting bees that were actively using our plots. And so this was kind of exciting. When, when the, in the areas where crested wheatgrass was still very prevalent, it really clogged the landscape and didn't allow for much, if any, bare ground, which is what a lot of native bees are targeting for their, to, be, to dig their nest. The second graph I'm going to show you are the foraging native bees. And so these and so this is from our sweep net data. And so again, the herbicide plots had one, they had increased flowers. They also had increased native bee foraging. And if you're a hunt if you're a honeybee person, this is good news as well. We also saw a dramatic increase in honeybees utilizing the the herbicide plots. And so, conclusion of this study is that we had increased native bee and honeybee foraging in the herbicided plots. We had increased ground nesting bees utilizing the herbicide plots. 
And most of this was due to an increase in floral resources and bare ground in the herbicide plots. And the interesting thing for me with this project is that all the graphs or, or uh, plots that I, or, that I showed you were basically combined over the two-year project, but those results were almost instantaneous. So within a month, month and a half, we were seeing an immediate impact of the prairie restoration on uh, native bees and honeybees. Okay, the second project that deals with energy formation is where I did a project over in Mississippi looking at biofuels, specifically cellulosic biofuels and or that uh, these grasses, they were grasses, but they could also be used for livestock forage. And I'll explain that in a minute. All of this work took place in what is termed the uh, Black Belt of the South or in Mississippi, they call it the Black Prairie. You can kind of, you can see that on the map. They caught, you don't think of the southeast as a, as a prairie habitat, but there is a section of the southeast that is called the Black Belt region in which historically it was native warm season uh, prairie grasses. They call it the Black Belt because the soil is extremely organic rich and has a very dark color to it. The majority of this prairie has been destroyed, uh, mostly for agricultural reasons. And so with this project, we were looking at converting basically old corn fields into cellulosic grass fields that could be used for biofuels and or livestock forage. And so we had multiple treatments. We had monocultures of a non-native grass, Bermuda grass, which is very commonly grown in the Southeast. We had monocultures of a native grass called Indian grass. Then we had native grass mixtures. And with these treatments, we put cattle on most of them. And the idea for cattle, even though it's not energy related, in order to, in, uh, to give incentives for people to switch from corn to some of these biofuel crops, is we're trying to see if there's multiple uses that, that you can get out of the land. Can you harvest biofuels and actually uh, graze livestock? And so these riveting photos that I'm, I'm showing you, I just, I just want to impress upon you that, you know, we had a cornfield, the cornfield was completely removed, everything was plowed over, and basically we started with bare dirt. So I'm just basically showing you that we started at, you know, ground zero, so bare dirt, and then we seeded these, these plots, and then the two photos on the right are uh, a couple of the, what the plots looked like after the grasses had grown. And so for this particular project, I used, instead of using like the previous project where I used sweep nets and emergence traps, I used a, a, a passive trapping mechanism for pollinating insects. And these are just simply termed colored bowl or pan traps. And as the name implies, it's, a, it's basically a plastic colored bowl. Usually people use yellow, white, and or blue. These are supposed to somewhat mimic a flower, and so if a pollinator is flying within in the nearby area, it will land into the bowl, which has soapy water. The soap basically breaks surface tension, and the, the pollinator will drown in the soapy water, and then you can get relative abundances of the insects. Okay, so I'm just reminding you that native bees primarily nest in the ground. And for this project, we saw kind of two main groups of native bees. The two photos on your left are two types of smaller sweat bees. And the two photos on your right are larger bees, about the size of a honeybee or so. And we collectively call those digger bees. Digger bees meaning they're really good at digging into the ground. The middle schematic photo just shows you a schemat what, what a very schematic bee nest might look like. And so when you see a native bee land on a flower, it's collecting pollen and nectar. The female brings that pollen and nectar back to a nest. It forms a little pollen ball. When the pollen ball gets big enough, it lays an egg on it. The egg hatches, the larvae consumes the pollen, and the bee goes through a developmental stage until an adult, and then the process starts over. 
And so keep in mind, we're gonna, I'm going to quickly show you a couple of graphs about the sweat bees and the digger bees. And so we did this project for two years, 2011, 2012. So in the early spring of 2011, that's when the grasses were seeded into, onto the bare ground. And so what you're looking at here is the most common genus, Lassia glossum, of sweat bees that were collected. And so what we saw was that generally the native grass mixtures harbored more sweat bees more ground nesting sweat bees. But what you see from this graph is that that held true in 2011, but by 2012, everything goes flatline for the sweat bees. So the numbers drop and we don't see any kind of significant results compared to the different types of grasses. So I thought this was interesting and I, I didn't make a lot of sense of it until, and I want you to keep this graph in your head. And when I go to the next one, what you're looking at here are the digger bees, the 2011, 2012. So 2011, we didn't see any treatment effects. We fairly low numbers, but in 2012, you can see that we, we get a, a big jump in the number of digger bees that we're seeing. And once again, these native grass mixtures start taking off as far as what was utilizing these fields. So it's almost a complete opposite of the smaller sweat bees. And so what I, what I think is going on or what has gone on is that the smaller sweat bees were kind of the early colonizers. They came into the, the bare patches in these fields, created a lot of ground nests. But by the second year, these larger ground nesting bees come in and start out competing the smaller sweat bees for nest sites. Okay, so I've talked about a prairie restoration project, which is analogous to natural gas and oil pipelines. Talked about cellulosic biofuels that were grown in Mississippi. And so the last project that I'll just quickly share with you is looking at the development of solar facilities and the impacts it has on pollinators. And all of this work was done in the Mojave Desert in California. It was done on the Ivanpah Solar Facility, which is one of the largest solar facilities in the world. And so in the, the bottom right picture is, a, is a, an actual photo of the Ivanpah, part of the Ivanpah Solar Facility. And so for this project, I used a different type of trap. So in previous projects, we talked about sweep netting, emergence traps, colored bowl traps, and in this project I used what is known as a vein trap, and that's the photo on the left. That photo was not taken in the desert, but that was from another project that I worked on, so a little more uh, green as opposed to the desert. Uh, but the, the vein trap is uh, this yellow and blue container, put a little soapy water in it, insects hit the, the blue veins and then they fall into the collecting container. So it's an, it's just another technique that pollinator ecologists will utilize to, to uh, collect native bees and other pollinators. On this facility they were exploring the different ways of actually putting in the mirrors and so this is, this is showing you the, the three treatments that were, were used. One is called a bladed treatment, and that's the, the top left. And then, again, this is after the treatments had been put in, these photos are. And so for the bladed project, what they did is they came with a V plow and basically plowed everything up. So you're looking at uh, soil disruption um, you know, below ground and above ground. And all of these treatments are designed to one... Uh, get rid of a lot of vegetation. Second treatment that they that they explored with was simply mowing, and they would put their their mower blades at about 14, 15 inches high, and then basically chop everything off uh, at that level. The the third type of treatment they did was what they termed a halo, and so within the solar facility, they would uh, make these little concentric circles with you know in and around the mirrors where they actually didn't do any type of vegetation prep and then of course from a scientist standpoint we went outside the solar facility and made our 
controls in which there were no mirrors. So those are the, basically the three treatments and a control that, that we looked at as far as pollinators. And in each of these different types of treatments, we, we put uh, vein traps out and left them for periods of time. And so just to quickly give you an idea of what we did, um, we did this in 2018 and 19. I'm only showing you the 2018 data because we are still going through the, the insects collected from 2019. And so what you're looking at here is just, this is all the bees put together. And so bladed and mowed, not real good for bees. As, but interestingly enough, the halo and the control plots were uh, pretty similar in the number of bees that, that were uh, documented. So here's a, a good example of uh, a solar facility put it, trying to figure out a ecological sound way of putting in mirrors. And the little halo idea really has, has a, a positive impact on uh, bee abundance. And so those are three projects that, I, that I've worked on, you know, that have something to do with energy development. And so in conclusion, when, when you look at all of these projects, when you're thinking about pollinators, there's two main things you got to think about. One is the vegetation. What is the type of vegetation and what it, how is it structured within the landscape? Is it providing floral resources? Uh, what do the root systems look like and how does it affect soil? And then the second type, which you should realize is very important, is how does energy development disrupt soil? So the bulk of your native pollinators nest in the ground. So if you disturb soil, you potentially disturb their nesting structure. And so I'll end there. So I just want to thank you for those that came to listen. Again, I apologize for not being there due to the weather. And I do want to just say that all of these different projects that I have worked on, it, it, they are collaborative projects with um, the USDA and multiple universities. So thank you very much.